Today is April 2nd, and today is Autism Speaks Light It Up Blue campaign. According to them, Autism Speaks celebrates the UN-sanctioned World Autism Day every single year on April 2nd. And to do this, they encourage you to wear blue. Now, in my last video, many of you in the comment section mentioned to wear hashtag red instead, which is a counter movement to the hashtag light it up blue. But why would there even be a counter movement to the largest autism nonprofit in the world? Well, if you watched my recent video about Autism Speaks, you might get a pretty good reason as to why. And well, it turns out I have some more stuff to add to it and it's not good. And a fair amount of you guys in the comment section saw this coming. And this really was not pleasant for anyone who was involved in this video, but things like this need to be brought to the surface. So what a better day to do it than on their big day. Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Blair or the Illuminati and today we are going to talk a bit more about the foundation Autism Speaks. If you haven't heard the part one I did on them talking about what they stand for and the fear mongering they use to get donations, I'd highly recommend you watch that first. But I'm assuming you're here because you're ready to see what else there is to still dig up. So let's get into it. I'd also like to start this off by saying that I was incredibly touched by all of the incredible comments on my video covering Autism Speaks. So many of you came out with your own stories about having a friend, or family member, or many of you being on the spectrum yourselves. I'm so happy to hear that my subscribers know that autism isn't some horrible life ruining disorder like Autism Speaks wants to portray. For many, it allows them to see the world differently and makes them unique in a way that they express themselves. And organizations like this do more harm than good. But as you can guess, we're not done with Autism Speaks. And if you thought it couldn't get any worse, it does. We've talked about their old videos, their disturbing mission statement, their position on vaccines, the lack of research, and the lack of support. It's hard to believe they could dig themselves into an even deeper hole, but Autism Speaks somehow managed that. It's so bad that I want to tell you right now upfront that there will be mentions of actual torture in this video. If you think that's too much for you, I understand and I totally get it if you click away. I'll give a warning each time the subject comes up, but please know that it will come up on multiple occasions in this video, and I don't want anyone to be unprepared for that. So with that out of the way, let's dive right in and see what else is wrong with this foundation that I originally thought couldn't get any more despicable. When it comes to better managing autism in children, there's a few different routes one can take. Early intervention is key in order to help an autistic child have the resources and services they need to not only better understand themselves, but the world around them. We briefly touched upon that in the last video, and now we're going to go a little deeper into what these things are and where Autism Speaks comes into play with this. Parentcenterhub.org lists these services as the following. Assistive technology, devices a child might need, audiology or hearing services, speech and language services, counseling and training for a family, medical services, nursing services, nutrition services, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and psychological services. Some families might use these services more than others depending on the child's need, of course, but it's important that they have access to them. These services are to provide what many autistic people want, a way to be better understood. In one case published in The Atlantic in 2016, these services weren't enough. Kyle, age 17 at the time, received electroshock therapy at John Hopkins in Baltimore. His mother explained that Kyle would often hurt himself and even after a nine month stay in the neurobehavioral unit at the Kennedy Krieger Institute, the doctors had no success. Kyle was discharged with a floor mat to cushion the blows when he hammered his head on the ground, splints on his arms to prevent him from hitting his face, and thick tights to protect his thighs and abdomen from his pinching. Kyle's mother goes on to explain that electroshock therapy isn't the barbaric treatment method people make it out to be, and how every other option was exhausted. A last resort for a desperate family that did their research and realized it might be right for them. Kyle is one example of a person whose self-injury behaviors or SIB were successfully lowered with electroshock therapy. Thankfully, it doesn't have to come to that for many children because electroshock therapy has many risks we'll be getting into in a moment. 
Although more than a fourth of children with autism may engage in SIB, there are many ways to understand and help available. Dr. Brian A. Iwata, the head of the Neurobehavioral Unit at Kennedy Krieger, recorded data with 152 people over almost 4,000 sessions and concluded the following. Some 38% of children hurt themselves as a form of escape. About a fourth wanted attention, food, or toys, and another fourth hurt themselves for sensory input. A small number had more than one purpose for their behavior. With that information, the team crafted individualized treatments, such as teaching and reinforcing useful behaviors to replace self-injury in the child's repertoire. Dr. Iwata and many others advocated functional communication training to teach children ways of requesting what they want. A child who could point to a picture to communicate his need for a break or a drink would not need to bang his head to achieve the same purpose. Functional communication training is now considered very effective for SIB. But how does this relate to Autism Speaks? Well, these are the cases that Autism Speaks highlights. Autism Speaks in their videos especially talks about how difficult it is to handle autism or how impossible managing it might be. Despite, of course, the clear evidence in this research stating that autism is something to be understood, not feared. But Autism Speaks did it again, you guys. Rather than take this research about communication and, you know, fund it or dive deeper into it or question what ways their foundation could do more to promote functional communication training, they went to the absolute extremes. After all, they've grouped autistic people into one box since they were founded, so why would they stop now? Electroshock therapy worked for Kyle, after all. So Autism Speaks, with their misguided, fear-mongering tactics to scare up donations and justify their bloated sense of self-importance, decided to endorse an electroshock therapy center that unfortunately did not know what they were doing. So what exactly is electroshock therapy? The Mayo Clinic defines ECT as a procedure done under general anesthesia, in which a small electric current is passed through the brain, intentionally triggering a brief seizure. ECT seems to cause changes in brain chemistry that can quickly reverse symptoms of certain mental health conditions. ECT often works when other treatments are unsuccessful and when the full course of treatment is completed, but it may not work for everyone. Much of the stigma attached to ECT is based on early treatments in which high doses of electricity were administered without anesthesia, leading to memory loss, fractured bones, and other serious side effects. ECT is much safer today, although it still may cause some side effects. It now uses electric currents given in a controlled setting to achieve the most benefit with the fewest possible risks. They go on to say that it's done for severe depression, mania, catatonia, and agitation and aggression from dementia. The risk can include confusion, memory loss, physical side effects, and medical complications. In other words, yes, ECT can be beneficial, but it's risky and seen as a last resort and needs to be taken very seriously. Inducing a seizure will increase heart rate and blood pressure that could even lead to heart problems in rare cases. Now, here's what ticks me off about Autism Speaks in this whole situation. We've gone through how even the most challenging aspects of some autistic patients can be handled, how electroshock therapy should be seen as a last and nothing else works resort. It needs to be done professionally, carefully, and is seen as a management tool. So why does Autism Speaks think it's okay to endorse electroshock therapy as a treatment for autism? And not just, oh, promoting carefully monitored electroshock therapy for the small percent that need it, but a center that has actually been deemed as torture. And no, I'm not exaggerating here. On Saturday, November 2nd, 2013, as you can see from the scanned images of their cards, Autism Speaks promoted the Judge Rottenberg Center as a service provider. The JRC, once the Behavioral Research Institute, was founded in 1971 by Harvard psychologist Matthew Israel. Matthew first opened up shop in California, taking in students with significant development, neurological, and behavioral disabilities with a no expulsion, no rejection policy. Now, let me pause for just a second there. A no expulsion, no rejection policy. 
Now, this might seem like a great thing when it comes to schools, when it comes to general businesses not turning people away, but this is a horrible, horrible thing when it comes to autism treatment. And why you might ask? Because treatment needs to be individualized. Different people are going to respond to different things and to not let them go because your method isn't working for them is disgusting. It's not as if Matthew was here gently speaking to the kids and using proven communicative methods either. And this is where you will be receiving the first warning that what I'm about to mention is pretty disturbing. His methodology of treatment was predicted on techniques called adversive intervention slaps, forced inhalation of ammonia, food deprivation, sleep deprivation, prolonged restraint, deep muscle pinches intended to inflict maximum pain, and long-term seclusion. One of the more disturbing practices that Israel, Matthew Israel, favors is called behavioral rehearsal lessons, in which students are coerced into producing unwanted behaviors solely for the purpose of subsequently punishing them. Essentially, aversive interventions operate on the same philosophy that some people apply to animals. If you pair an unwanted behavior with a pain stimulus, the unwanted behavior will go away. And oh my God. And this is on children with behavioral disabilities. And this man was recommended by Autism Speaks. It gets so much worse than I thought. I mean, I won't lie to you guys. When I first started researching this video, I thought, okay, well, we'll talk about how electroshock therapy is messed up and when it's improperly used and how Autism Speaks shouldn't be blanket recommending it to people that trust them for advice. But no, this is straight up torture. And not only that, but it's actually killed people. In California, one of Israel's students died as a result of his treatment methods. This was a 22-year-old named Vincent who passed away while in restraints at one of Israel's homes. Because of the man's tactics on treating autism, somehow, somehow, he avoided prison time. The BRI relocated at first to Rhode Island, but when their regulatory agency refused to permit Israel to continue there, he settled in Canton, Massachusetts. Matthew Israel had the idea here that rather than use electroshock therapy as intended, which was very carefully, that he would use it as a means of aversive therapy, the negative reinforcement. And this just puts me at an absolute loss of words. Matthew Israel invented his own device, a torture device really, called the Graduated Electronic Decalator designed to be more powerful and painful than a police taser. And for those of you who don't know how painful a police taser is, people call it overwhelming and often the most painful experience of their lives. And in some cases, people have died from those tasers. Now, I need to put in a few more warnings here again. It's going to get graphic. That's your heads up. So take a deep breath. And with this graduated electronic decelerator, Students were forced to wear electrodes attached to various parts of their bodies, and whenever they engage in any unwanted behavior, anything from headbanging to flapping their hands to getting out of their seat without permission, staff would press a button that caused an electric shock. When the state of Massachusetts attempted to end this barbaric practice, Israel sued the regulating agency. When he prevailed, forcing the then commissioner of mental retardation to resign, he renamed the facility after the judge who oversaw the agreement, Ernest Rottenberg. Thus, this is why the name Judge Rottenberg Center exists that Autism Speaks promoted in 2013. Apparently, this judge not only told him he was free to continue, he just had to get court approval when he wanted to use aversion therapy on a patient. I wish I could say I was joking. Sometimes evil wins the battle. I can promise you there's a sort of halfway good ending to all of this. But in 2007, the state of Massachusetts could not shut Matthew Israel down. People were dying, but Matthew Israel had the perfect ally. State Representative Jeffrey Sanchez had a nephew, Brandon that was in Matthew Israel's care since the age of 12. Israel is said to have shocked the same Brandon more than 5,000 times in one day alone. 
Although Autism Speaks was promoting the JRC in 2013, people knew about these horrific acts far sooner. In the Boston Magazine in 2008, when describing the shocks, students called it the longest two seconds of their lives and that the school says the graduated electronic decelerator or GED needed more juice. A couple years after the GED was first developed, the school made a new one, upping the milliamps from 15 to 41 and the voltage to 66 and calling it the GED IV. It burned skin. Legislators called it barbaric. But what's disturbed me the most is how they describe the shocks as punishment. According to the school's protocol, employees are to tell a student why he is receiving a shock. The state report refers to this as a pinpoint. The first of the rec room GEDs is given without a pinpoint for the behavior. The student was given a second GED with a pinpoint for physical aggression. The student is then heard asking, let them rotate me. Every hour, staffers must rotate the electrodes so they don't burn the skin. Though the school denies the GED injures students, Greg Miller says burns happened often enough that JRC staff had a name for the student going off to the machine so his skin could heal. A GED holiday. 18 was given for swearing. 19 was given with the accompanying pinpoint, no refusing to follow staff directions. The student responded to this with, yes, sir. 20 was given with no pinpoint. 21 again for refusing to follow directions. After 30 shocks in a single day, staffers were to get approval from a psychologist to shock more. A staffer at one point tried to call someone in upper management from the bathroom. You weren't supposed to use your cell phone on duty, and the bathroom was the only place that didn't have a camera, but he had no reception. The article then describes how this student was given a 37th, 38th, and 39th shock for attempting to remove the GED. 50 to 53 were for verbal threats, 10 more shocks for yelling, and at the end of the day, this poor student had received 77 shocks. This isn't electroshock therapy. This isn't what Kyle received at the start of the video. And this isn't what the Mayo Clinic is talking about when they say carefully given electroshock therapy can potentially help severely catatonic and aggressive patients. This is not it. This has honestly made me gag. I'm appalled. And it's made me want to throw my computer across the room. Describing the student afterwards, the first staffer said he was done. There was no more him. His skin was very red. The student complained later that night of a racing heart, a dry mouth. He couldn't breathe, he said. He felt as if he were about to have a stroke. The report says no staff took action to help him, and the student remains at JRC, but is off the machine. The article goes on to say that advocates for the disabled have no one to blame for JRC's survival but the parents of its students, and it's a shame, because it was the parents advocating for JRC. Parents that didn't really know what their children may be going through exactly, but desperate for this resource. Matthew Israel took advantage, knowing he was all they had. One parent explains he would rather have his son shocked for a short amount of time than exhibit SIB behaviors. But it's not a short amount of time, really. And to terrify children into behaving? Torturing children into behaving? It's not only that. Israel's methods were more than questionable. They were cruel and they were fatal. At least six students with disabilities died at JRC, either directly or indirectly because of the torture inflicted upon them in the name of treatment. Honestly, there are so many articles about the JRC that detail their cruelty, and it's no secret. It's not hard to find what they do. It's not as if Autism Speaks couldn't have simply typed a name into Google, done the most basic of searches in 2013, and realized who they were promoting. To endorse electroshock therapy is one thing. Electroshock therapy in of itself has many, many risks and a dark, depressing history. When it was first created and used in the US, it was around the time lobotomies were popular. Needless to say, we've taken huge strides in medicine since then. I don't wanna say that Kyle or his mother from the start of the video are doing the wrong thing. Even Psychology Today came out in support that Autism Speaks would endorse electroshock. But the problem is bigger than that. It's not with this carefully controlled technique being used in limited, rare, last resort circumstances. 
It's that Autism Speaks was endorsing this organization that uses torture for some of its most severe members in the community. That's what kills me. That's what's made me want to gag and scream and what's been so rage inducing. I had no idea. I didn't even want to believe that this could even be a possibility in modern times. It sounds like something straight out of a horror movie or how people that were tortured in medieval times, but this was going on just seven years ago. That's really, in the grand scheme of things, not a very long time. Autism Speaks was putting them, that name, on the cards they handed out to probably thousands of people at their awareness walks. I wonder how many parents called that center. I wonder how many students that went to that center was because of Autism Speaks. It really makes my skin crawl. I am, at least, pleased to say that Matthew Israel stepped down. Apparently, this was an order to avoid prison time, and he got five years probation, and that's not enough. People died in his care, and he only got probation? The good in this, really, is that it's just not happening anymore. I say it's a sort of good ending because it would be a good ending if he went to jail, in my opinion, but that obviously didn't happen. This wasn't enough. It wasn't nearly enough. And the center is actually still open, but they have a 24 seven monitoring system. So at least it doesn't seem like this kind of thing is going on in there anymore. I'd say rename it at the very least and lock up Israel, but you know, hey, whatever. That's just my opinion, I guess. Later on, Autism Speaks came out and denounced the JRC once their full actions came to light. Some patients as young as nine or 10 were receiving these shocks. Video was released, there was a public outcry, and Autism Speak said, we oppose the use of electric shock in behavior modification treatments. The video of the student receiving this type of treatment at the Judge Rottenberg Center is appalling and Autism Speaks joins the many other organizations in calling for the end of this abuse. They also added on their website that they don't condone aversion therapy, which is pretty convenient after supporting it for the many, many years when they endorsed this center. I don't know how many times I have to say it, but if you are a giant corporation, you need to know what you're supporting. Seriously, why is this so difficult? Autism Speaks rakes in millions of dollars every single year, but they aren't doing proper research about organizations they recommend you talk to on the back of their cards. It's ridiculous. But really, this topic as a whole has opened my eyes a lot to the way people view autism. It's despicable and loathsome. Reading some of the stuff and studies that came out of the JRC has made my blood absolutely boil. It's made me want to cry. It's made me want to vomit. And I, I cannot imagine the children that had to endure this. The children, this type of treatment isn't therapy. It's torture. It's straight up torture. And I wished... I had some kind of relief in knowing that Matthew Israel was in prison where he can't hurt anyone again, but I don't. No human being deserves to suffer through this. We have laws that prevent us from torturing terrorists, but not autistic children. If you supported Autism Speaks after this video, I don't know how you can possibly justify that position. Being vocal about what you stand for is important and Autism Speaks told the world that they supported JRC. They took it back, but I seriously wonder with their reputation being what it is, if they ever even bothered to look up that organization's history in the first place. People knew, articles were out long before that walk. They could have taken a look for themselves, but they didn't because Autism Speaks is not about loving, nurturing, and communicating with the autistic population. How could it be? if this is how they treat the people that go to them for help. I could go on and on about how appalled I am, but I have to stop here. I hope you all survived this one because I, I didn't really expect it to be quite this dark, and I don't know if anyone really could. Please, please know what you're supporting. Know where your money goes when you do research into charities. There are many good charities out there. This does not seem to be one of them. And so that is where I'm going to end today's video. Sometimes these more difficult videos are the more important ones, and they are often difficult because they deal with topics that are hard to deal with, that are hard to realize are actually happening in our modern world. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below, because I'm sure many of you have very severe opinions about what you've heard today. 
Um, I would say if you enjoyed that video to hit the like button, but I don't know if this is really enjoyable to hear more as this is something that you might need to hear. But subscribe if you want more content from me in the future so we can uncover more things that companies have been up to. And make sure to share this video around. Before you let your friends and family donate, make sure to let them know what this company has supported and the behaviors that they engage in. I think that's really important. But if you guys want more content from me, something perhaps a little more light and playful, open up my description box. You're gonna find links to my social media, the second channel for my puppy Casper, and my collaboration channel with Sad Milk. Thank you guys again for making it to another video. I love you guys. Hug somebody and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.